So I'm, it, there's a revolution underway, and it's a revolution in how companies and organizations get funded. You might have heard about some of them. Indiegogo is here in the house. The founder of Indiegogo is uh, really one of the leaders. I, it caught my eye because uh, you know I, I've been watching all these companies get funded this way, um, whether it be a, a sensor company or a, a guy who makes a GoPro uh, Steadicam, which I just saw from Australia. And a lot of them would say they chose Indiegogo because um, the other guys are uh, US only. And anyways, we're gonna get into it. What is going on with this funding revolution, this crowdfunding revolution, Indiegogo right now? That was great. Sorry. And who are you? Uh, thanks, Robert, for having me. I'm Slava Rubin, co-founder and CEO of Indiegogo. And, uh, you know, I was a strategy consultant for a while, actually almost eight years. And just prior, when I was a kid, my dad died of cancer. So I was uh, trying to make good on, you know, doing something good about that. Uh, I really, for 10 years, really suppressed it and started my own charity. And it was actually quite frustrating to use MySpace and PayPal at the time to try to raise money. My two co-founders, Eric and Danae, they also had a mutual frustration of trying to raise money. Eric was on the board of a theater company. Danae was working with different filmmakers and entrepreneurs. We came together in 2006 overlooking the Golden Gate Bridge and thought, hey, the internet's all about democratization of every industry. Why is it that access to capital is all about gatekeepers? Very naively, we just said, why not just create a platform where anybody can raise money for any idea? Isn't that crazy? Indi <laughs> and Indiegogo was born. And, and now, uh, how many, how many things have been funded on Indiegogo up to date? Yeah, it's wild. I mean, if you talk about numbers, I mean, we've had the most campaigns of any platform in the world, nearly 150,000. But more importantly, if you talk about individual campaigns, we had the first ever crowdfunded baby. We just had the largest uh, technology funding, nearly $13 million for a phone. We had, uh, you know, as part of the Turkish revolution, there was the campaign to fund uh, one page ad in the New York Times so that you know the people can speak out and not get held down by the government of Turkey. So each one of these campaigns is really quite incredible. Or you could also find more fun campaigns like really interesting socks called Bombus, or there's the Vibes, which is an interesting new smart vibrator. So there's everything you would want there, Robert. <laughs> and I have one of those vibrators. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> I did a whole review. Um, what you know? What's behind? What's why now? Why is this taking? Why didn't this happen with PayPal and, and the previous uh, generation of online services? I think it's really the convergence of all the different technologies coming together. Um, I think you see that the 80s was all about desktop computing. The 90s was all about online commerce. 2000s was all about social. And this decade, in my opinion, will go down as the decade of funding and access to capital. Yeah. I mean, you really have things like Facebook and MySpace and Friendster, things like PayPal and credit cards and Square and other things, and really all these trust and um, ways of transparency have really allowed for uh, this to happen. It really uh, changed uh, the hardware industry because it, it was really hard to get funded for hardware in the previous generation. You know, if you had to go to Sand Hill Road sure. and talk to venture capitalists and they, giving you, you know, a couple million dollars or $14 million, million dollars, like I think Pebble Watch raised on, on crowdsourcing, it would be really difficult. Uh, they, they just didn't believe in hardware. They didn't like it. It wasn't uh, exponential enough, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. And then uh, Indiegogo and the other guys, you know, Kickstarter and others come out and all of a sudden the gates are open. Uh, do you think there's other areas that are like that, that are open now, that weren't open? That, that Absolutely. I mean, we're seeing uh, the music industry really ripe with Indiegogo, the film industry. We just had Academy Award um, nominee. You see the hardware industry is a great example because um, I think the VC model is not set up, as you were saying, to really work on the lack of um, scale that hardware can get to. So it was easier to go towards a software company. So. You know, there's only a few gates to of where they can go. They go to the bank, they go to credit cards, they go to VC, they try to find a grant. There never was this opportunity to just go straight to the market and find if there's validation there and if people cared about it. I think hardware is a great industry. I think even nonprofits, you're seeing a lot of, um, you know, opportunities for more funding because it's becoming more social. And really where you're seeing a huge one is just on your mom and pop vanilla small businesses. 
they're getting turned down by their local small banks uh, or even big banks because if you don't have enough revenues, which is two years of revenues, you're pretty much just shut down by their credit risk models. But here, your strangers and your neighbors can fund you to see that local pizza shop, that brewery, or whatever it is that they want to see happen. That's crazy. Yeah. You know, a lot of entrepreneurs say they want to build a platform, but you've actually done it. What would you say to an entrepreneur that wants to build a platform of any kind, not just a crowdfunding one to compete with you, but sure. you know, any kind of platform? What, what did you learn by building this? It's funny that you say a platform to compete with us. We're actually so open and we have no judgment on Indiegogo that we've actually had, and I think, nearly seven competitors now funded on Indiegogo. <laughs> meaning funding platforms that say we'll be better than Indiegogo, which to me, it's totally great. We're an open platform and it's really, I would say, the sincerest form of flattery that they're using Indiegogo to compete with us. In terms of building a platform, I don't know that we set out to say we want to have this enormous platform. That was the goal. But really, I think you need to start off with the very simple product market fit where you have functionality that there's a need that customers actually want to use it. Yeah. Now, just to give you an example of that, when we launched in January 2008, we launched in just in English and in dollars. And we very quickly figured out that this wasn't just an American phenomenon, which is access to capital. So we right away empowered the financial innovation system behind us to work with every country of the world. And within just months, we were literally funding in every other country of the world, whether it was Bolivia, to Belgium, to Australia, and the point there is that the demand was there. Yep. And people were saying, hey, I wish I could fund this, or I wish there was another way for me to find money. It just so happens that my two co-founders and I came up with a method to try to fulfill that need. So in terms of building a platform, I think you need to start off with a good product market fit, constantly iterate on what the customers are telling you, use different data as well as creativity to improve the product, and then hopefully you can find ways to scale it out. Yeah, it's really incredible, I, you know, talking to uh, the guys in Australia who are building uh, this uh, GoPro Steadicam. Yep. Um, you know, uh, they can start a company in the middle of nowhere, right? Yeah. And they can get access to capital. It, it used to be you had to come to San Francisco to start a technology company and be near Sand Hill Road, right? Um, where, what do you think is going to be the trick? Where, where, how else do you think that the world is going to change because of that? Because people can start companies anywhere and have access to this kind of capital. You know, I think a really good example to look at is look what you're doing. You've created an incredible channel, right? 50 years ago, you couldn't do that because you wouldn't have been part of CBS, yeah. right? Or NBC or ABC. And it was these three huge entities that owned all of it. And then before you knew it, you had cable TV, there was a few more channels. Before you know you had satellite, there was a few more channels. Before you know it, there was internet, there was a lot more channels. And now you have YouTube and every other opportunity. 80 hours of uh, video uploaded every minute, right? Exactly, so now <laughs> really the potential to put your video up is much easier, right? Cost of production is down, cost of distribution is down. It's really about finding it. Yeah. I think you're seeing the same thing in capital, which it used to be just a few big banks. And if you didn't get money from those few big banks, you weren't getting money. And then you move forward, you started to get credit cards or VCs or there's government grant organizations. Yeah. And now you're starting to get the YouTubization of finance, which is Indiegogo, which anybody can have access to capital and they just need to be able to find themselves relevant, just like that video. You've clearly succeeded and I think now anybody can be empowered to do the same thing. I mean, for me, an entrepreneur is the greatest stimulant to an improved economy. If you give an entrepreneur the opportunity to change something, they can really improve the entire world, whether it's you know, just new socks, whether it's the first ever medical tricorder, which was just funded on Indiegogo, like straight out of Star Trek, which is super cool. And, uh, or like we talked about the Turkish revolution. We might take a look at it and give, yeah. give some tips to somebody who's coming onto Indiegogo for the first time and thinking about, you know, crowdfunding a book or a band or a restaurant or something like that. Sure. What, have you seen a pattern of what works yeah. to really uh, get, the, get the community excited so that they do uh, fund something? Absolutely. So just looking at some of the examples that are uh, online here, I mean, we're just on the popular page right now, but you'll see there's a kite patch here, which is this really cool technology, uh, which is mosquito fighting. So they put this on them and then this way the mosquitoes aren't biting them, which is really relevant in Africa where they're trying to fight malaria and such. But if you're just going camping, it could be good just to have, which obviously they're funded over half a million dollars. Or you have here uh, Canary, so the first ever home security device. They actually had tons of VC interest, 
and they actually didn't take the VC interest because they wanted to have a better position in the negotiation yeah. and now have raised nearly $1.6 million and lots of investors have come uh, uh, coming into them. Or you see uh, Smosh, which is one of the biggest, I believe, YouTube channels out there and they're uh, you know funding a game and you have other cool stuff. We have the most data of any platform in the world and we actually have constantly analyzed that data. So now I don't have to speak from opinions yeah. of how to have a good campaign. If you actually break it all down, uh, there's three things that matter. Number one, you want to have a good pitch. Number two, you want to be proactive. And number three, you want to find an audience that cares. If you want a lot more detail about this, you could go on our site to our blog, where in the insights section, we're constantly putting out new data. To give you some more meat to those three things, have a good pitch. We know if you have a video as part of your campaign, you'll raise 114% more money on average than if you don't have a video as part of your campaign. And is there a length to the video that should Optimal that length will be between two to three minutes. The best way to structure the video will be in three modules. The first module is just, hi, this, I'm talking to Indiegogo, I wanna tell you about my passion, and it's especially for the Indiegogo campaign, 15 to 30 seconds. The second module is up to two minutes. You can take this module out and market it anytime you want. It's not specific to Indiegogo. You're explaining what you're talking about yeah. here and you can use it in the future. There's even t uh, companies that help you do explainer videos. Absolutely. You know, that are marketing videos for your front uh, Absolutely. website or whatnot. And then the third module will be, okay guys, thank you very much for listening to the entire video. Please share, please do whatever you can. Fund now and if you can't fund, please tell your friends and your neighbors. And that module is specific to Indiegogo. Again, you don't wanna really go over three minutes. Shorter is better if you can be concise. You always want the people involved in the campaign to be part of the upfront because yeah. people like to fund people and then they care about the actual stuff. Um, we know on average a campaign will hit its target on day 36 of a 47 day long campaign. We know that average campaigns that hit their targets will have between three to eight perks. You never really want less than three, even though some campaigns will not have- What's a perk? What, what, what are uh, you thinking of? A perk is something that you get in return for different levels of funding. So for twenty five, like t-shirt, exactly. For twenty five dollars, maybe it's a t-shirt. For a hundred dollars, maybe it's a credit in the film. For five hundred dollars, it's an amazing hardware product. For a thousand dollars, you're listed as founder on the site. It's really anything virtual or physical that people get in return. It could also be a service. You could come by and play, you know, um, strum some strings at a show to uh, do a private song for them. Or if you did a campaign, you can get them on this show. It could be one of the perks you offer for five thousand dollars. Rocky, I think we should go to Indiegogo. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> we haven't even thought about monetizing this way and selling a, a Well, you a can shop, actually yeah. fund like a whole new show because yeah. I don't know what kind of shows you have in mind in the future, but maybe you want a show focused only on big data scientists and exploring the actual uh, knowledge behind that. Yeah. But maybe you don't have enough uh, sponsors or whether or not people want to support it. So you say, hey, if there's enough support for that, meaning I need to raise 100 grand, I'll just do it on my own. Now, uh, Gary Vaynerchuk just uh, is using his own custom uh, crowdfunding thing to fund his book. Okay. Do you let people do uh, their own branding and really come up with their own look and feel, or do you force people to be in, in the Indiegogo look and feel? Yeah, so in general, we found out through user experience testing that it's much better to be on the platform. We actually do have something called the EIC, the Embeddable Indiegogo Campaign, where you can have some branding but it really takes a lot of effort, and Gary probably can do this because he has a lot of his own fan base, yeah. so he can try to pull them towards his page. But really on Indiegogo, we're getting millions of page views, tens of millions of page views every month, and it's really helpful to be within our user experience and within our user flow. Yeah, it, it's uh, interesting because we have, I have a book coming out on context, Age of Context, and uh, I could fund the selling of that book using Indiegogo. You know, Absolutely. The book is done. Well, think about it like this. A book is another great example. So it seems like you're pretty far down the road already with yeah. the book. Either way, um, there's five things that you really get as benefit. And all five of these are probably relevant to you. Number one most relevant thing is market validation. Will people actually care to buy this book? Should I be writing it? Should I be spending the time and effort? Should I be getting an inventory? How many should I be printing? Yeah. Market validation. Number two is you get to test your marketing. What kind of taglines work? What kind of messaging works? What kind of market should I be marketing to? So you get to test your market in a more nimble, cheaper way today instead of tomorrow, more expensive and more committed. Yeah. Number three is you get more promotion. With Indiegogo, there's a lot of newspapers that want to cover us, a lot of blogs that want to cover us, a lot of media that wants to cover us. And that's because you're within the human interest story of Indiegogo. And it's really helpful to get that exposure, plus all the newsletters that we send out, the homepage exposure and things like that. 
Number four is I think actually the most powerful one. And I don't know how you're distributing your book if you're going through a publisher or other retailers, but you actually get to capture the data. Amazon. <laughs> Amazon. So with Amazon, you're not going to get the data of the customers. So you're not going to personally know who they are. Right? With Indiegogo, you would personally know who each one of your customers are. So you'd be able to create a relationship for your next book. Or you get to follow up when you want to have digital editions as chapters. So instead of going through Amazon, you can have a higher margin through Indiegogo and already knowing who they are. So you create a relationship not only for this one campaign forever. And number five is the obvious. You get money. This shows how it's changing everything. <laughs> because, you know, uh, whether you're selling a, a dog tag like I met in, yep. in the UK or uh, anything, really. I, you can think about how you're going to get m feedback from the market using th this kind of platform that you just couldn't get other ways. I think what's happening is all the same steps used to happen 20 or 30 years ago. Yeah. And the word business plan was used, you know, the 40 page paperweight, that's the equivalent of science fiction. But that was relevant because you first had to start with that. Then you had to say you're going to do market research and go interview some people. Then you had to go try to prototype something and then you had to go find some money and then you had to go follow up with picking out who your partners are. See what's happened I think with the internet and with Indiegogo and all the other technologies that are moving forward is the time frame has just collapsed. Yeah. So you literally are getting all of that in one campaign. Yeah. You're getting to do your business plan. You're getting to do your testing your market. You're getting to do your pick your partners. You're getting to do get your money. You're getting to do your customer uh, market validation. It's just, um, it's just collapsed. Yeah. How did you guys get funded? Are you, so we, all, are you all, all bootstrapped or? Yeah, so Indiegogo, uh, we bootstrapped the three founders with our own money. And that was uh, um, when we launched in January 2008. And we did that because we wanted to try to keep it more to ourselves. Yeah. Uh, we had a brilliant plan, which was in Q1, we were gonna come out, Q2, we were gonna get case studies. And Q3, we're going to promote those case studies and raise money. Now, this is Q3 2008. And for everybody that remembers, that's the beginning of the market crash. So yep. my brilliant plan went to shit. And uh, it really sucked because then through 2009, it was really rough times. And yep. we were trying to still figure out, is Indiegogo a good idea, not a good idea? Should we shut down? But it always felt like the wind was behind us as opposed to in our face. It always felt like somehow we were getting good feedback and we were moving in the right direction. And then we were able to get a small convertible note, which then led into a seed round in 2011 of 1.5 million. And 14 months later, we raised a $15 million A round. And that's what we're working with today. Very cool. And uh, you guys, uh, so when I sell my book and I collect, let's say I collect $100,000. Yep. How much do you get of that? And how much do I get? And how does that all get parted out? Sure, so assuming that uh, you set your target to be 10,000 or 50,000 or 100,000, you raise 100,000, we would charge you 4% as an Indiegogo fee. Okay. So that's pretty good, and you're going to make a lot of money on that. <laughs> so congratulations. <laughs> well, you have 60 employees now, right? Um, yeah, we've been growing pretty rapidly. That's it's crazy. it's been uh, pretty exciting. I mean, we're now uh, funding more uh, by lunchtime than we were funding in all of 2009. So in any one day. That's crazy. Well, congratulations on your success. I, you know, so many people have mentioned that they've used Indiegogo to get started, and you you really have caused a a startup revolution to happen, um, which very few people do. So congrats on changing the world. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thanks. And we get you get more information at Indiegogo.com, right? Yeah, and then my Twitter is just GoGoSlava. Very cool. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me.